everybody. It is uh, Tuesday afternoon here and uh, wherever you are joining us, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm super excited to have a longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Hedaya here with me today. We're going to dive deep into some new therapies for um, dysfunctional medicine, treating brain disorders, um, the neuropsychology. We're going to, we're going to dive deep. He's even going to share some slides, which I know um, my audience really loves those kind of technical uh, tidbits. And I know a lot of physicians listen and watch too. So uh, we're going to probably be speaking at a pretty high level. And uh, hopefully those of you who are um, not in medicine will enjoy it and uh, find it relevant. And of course, if you're a physician or a practitioner of any type in functional integrative precision or personalized medicine, I'm sure you will really enjoy Dr. Hedaya's Dr. presentation. Um, just a little housekeeping. If you want to find any of my information, we've got like 10 years of free blogs online at jillcarnahan.com. It's all free. I still write a blog every week because I really, really love to educate. Um, so you can find anything there. Um, if you want to find any products, uh, my store is just drjillhealth.com. And if you haven't been following on YouTube or on the podcast, uh, you can find this on anywhere you listen to podcasts, Stitcher, iTunes, etc. And you can also find all the reruns and the other uh, interviews I've done on my YouTube channel, which is just under my name, Jill Carnahan. We've literally got, I think this is almost the 90th episode. So we've got a lot of uh, free content there. If you like this, there's also another episode episode with Dr. Hedaya. If you enjoy this content, you can go and find that one as well and watch it there. Um, one other just update, um, you heard my last podcast called After the Fire, which came up very quickly. Um, you, Many of you have heard, uh, it's been nationally covered, the Marshall Fire on um, December 30th uh, really affected my hometown of Louisville and Superior. It caused uh, the loss of over a thousand homes and many businesses. Um, we're fine. We were located right smack dab in the center of my office of literally loss of homes and neighborhoods all around. So number one, I'm super grateful to be here. Um, Bob and I, Dr. Hade and I were talking right before this of just, you know, we are scientists first and we're in medicine, but we both believe that there's a lot of things we don't always see that really matter in life. And for me, this was just one more confirmation that not that I'm more special than anyone who lost homes, but I'm grateful to the fact that my office is still standing and I feel there's a great meaning and purpose in that. Um, so one of the things I'm gonna keep sharing with you is I've um, been partnering with air filter companies and we're gonna do our best to bring donations and resources to the community because you've probably heard me say before, clean air is so foundational to mental and physical health. And we take it for granted until we can't breathe. And I have just noticed now in the last several weeks, one of our biggest problems is all of the VOCs and the benzene and tooling and, and chemicals from the burning buildings has really affected our air quality. So I am absolutely dedicating any resources that I can gather to my community for improving the air quality. And like I said, if you want to partner or if you want to learn more, just stay tuned. Um, if you do want to just uh, be updated on any initiatives in our area, we've uh, dedicated an email and we'll be sending out um, updates on that. It's just clean air at flatironfunctionalmedicine.com. And you can just email there and say, would like more info and we will be sure to include you. Or if you'd like to donate or help with the um, cause, that would be great. So now without further ado, I'm going to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Hedaya to you. And then I will um, jump right in and let him present. Um, Dr. Hedaya, who has many, many initials behind his name, <laughs> has been practicing at the cutting edge of psychiatry, clinical psychopharmacology, and neuropsychology since 1979. He's pioneered the use of functional medicine in these fields. In 1996, he's clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical Center, where he's been awarded as teacher of the year on three occasions while teaching courses on effective mood disorders, cognitive therapy, and PNIE, which is psycho neuroimmune endocrinology, all of how these systems interconnect uh, in our bodies. He's also the winner of the prestigious Vincennial Award at Georgetown. He's an educator and faculty member at the Institute of Functional Medicine. He's author of three books, Understanding Biological Psychiatry, The Antidepressant Survival Guide, and Brain Recovery Center. He's also been featured in the local and national media, 2020, 60 Minutes, and many other places. Um, if you want to find more info, we'll repeat this at the end, but his website is www.wholepsychiatry.com. It is absolutely an honor and privilege to talk to you again, Dr. Hedaya. Um, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Call me Bob. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm uh, 
it's been 42 years since I've been doing this, I guess going on 43. So I'm listening to that. You read all those. I got me. I've done a lot of stuff. I've been, I know the time it does is like, wow, that a lot has actually happened. Well, let's go back real quickly before we dive into the topic. I would, and you probably said this last time you were on, but tell us a little bit about number one, how did you get into medicine? And then how did you get into functional medicine? What was your well, Yeah, I got into medicine. It was like, I basically was, following my older brother uh, you know i was always interested in science and curious about astronomy and you know, biology and that kind of thing but it was just uh, it was a thing to do in the 70s i truth truth is I, I think i was being guided i didn't really know what i was doing i was very immature extremely immature uh, i really <laughs> can't uh, but so i got into it and and i was always curious about basically trying to find the truth yeah bottom line, trying to find the truth and get to uh, what really works and what doesn't work. And then in, uh, I think it was 85, I had a patient that was doing standard psychiatry, you know, kind of cutting edge because I had trained at National Institute of Mental Health. So I really knew what was on the cutting edge. And I was doing cognitive behavioral therapy, which is cutting edge at the time, et cetera. And uh, I'm treating a woman with 50 years old with panic disorder which was easy to treat, cognitive behavioral therapy, imipramine, Xanax, you know, whatever it is, it's easy to treat, Nardil, phenylzine, whatever. She didn't respond for a year. Mm -hmm. And I've told this story so many times. And then she paged me when we had beepers those days, no phones, yes. at a wedding and uh, dancing Saturday night. And I get my beeper goes, oh, I got to go find a phone booth, you know. And uh, I call it. I said, Joanne, what's going on? She said, I'm having a panic attack. I'm like, what is going on here? It's a year already, wow. a year. And so I went into the office early Monday morning. The only thing I had was a CBC. And the CBC showed the MCV, the size of the red blood cells was 101, the normal 80 to 100. It's 101. I ignored it because I was trained yeah, it's just a little bit out of the range. And I didn't even know what it meant. Yeah. Okay. And it wasn't my domain. So I ended up doing some research. I said, oh, it could be a B12 deficiency, macrocytic anemia. And so I did a Schilling's test, which was available at the time. B12 deficiency, B12 injection, panic gone. Like, oh my God, what else am I missing here? What else? And then from there, my mother-in-law was ill and she died of myxedema. The internist didn't treat her properly. Wow. Had Days, this highly sensitive TSH, same test we're using today. The upper limit, you wouldn't believe this, Jill, was 10. Oh, my. <laughs> so she was mixedemitous wow. and, and kind of demented. Mm -hmm. And when I convinced the internist to treat her, he got her TSH to nine. She was a little better. I said, can we give her a little more? He said, no, she's normal. Wow. Died of mixedema, and I I feel terrible. I didn't have the confidence. I was, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not an internist, right? Well, now I'm really kind of like Mark Hyman says, accidental psychiatrist. I'm an accidental internist. Yeah. Oh, so was things like that, and just as you dig deep, you learn that the brain and the body are one thing, and then the spirit, the mind, the psychology, the social, etc. It's one thing. Yeah. And what I really learned in my training was, <clears throat> which was very confusing because everyone said that they had the answer to mental illness, you know, it's cognitive therapy or it's psychopharmacology or it's family systems. Yeah. What I really, it took me a long time to figure this out that they were all right. It just depended on the lens, the ma le level of magnification that you're looking at. Yeah. So that's why I came up with whole psychiatry because I like to kind of ex look from the molecular or submolecular to the spiritual and everything in between. That's kind of how I approach it. Bob, I love that story. A couple of things that are so relevant. Number one, truth seekers like you and I, and anyone in this field, we went into medicine, not just to be doctors, like that's an afterthought. It's great. But um, the truth is we want to know answers. And I think that that's the differentiating factor between someone who gets their medical degree and then stops learning. And, and you and I, and anyone in our field that's continuing on is I want to know the why. And so I'm always asking what else, what else, what else is possible? And that also opens it up, this up to stuff we weren't taught in medical school or that really kind of blows our minds sometimes. Like, how could this be possible? But it does seem to show a pattern. And then we look further and not that we have all the answers, but we're willing to ask the questions, right? 
And again, that's the difference between someone who's continuing to learn and grow. And I've seen things like we talked before we got on about some miracles that we've both seen that don't have any logical explanation, but that's a kind of wonder. And so we have the science background, but it's the open right brain creative that really gets the creative solutions that aren't always thought of. And again, you're in this field, you're, we're going to talk today about some of these creative solutions. You really need left and right brain. You need that ability to think outside the box because that's where we get these new solutions. And these things that, again, sometimes energetically don't make sense, but they start to fall into place. And then the other thing you alluded to is accidental internist or whatever field that we weren't trained in. In our system of conventional medicine, we're trained in silos. So we have the rheumatologist and the gastroenterologist and the neurologist, psychiatrist, and then Mia's family medicine, which is the least respected of all of them. Um, and, and what happens is we all have our own silos and we don't go outside there. And the truth is the body's one. So whether it's your joints or your brain or your um, you know, mental health, it's all connected. So you and I have really learned, we have to know a little bit about all these areas and then know the people that we can connect with. Like you as a psychiatrist, I would send someone to you if I need some deeper health on mental disorders and we can collaborate, but it's not silo medicine, is it? No, no, it's systems biology. Everything's everything's interacting with everything. Yeah, yeah. So let's introduce the topic. Well, and then let's go from you kind of got into the like you said the whole body and really as far as what I when I remember hearing functional medicine, it was like aha, right? Like that when we first hear that, it's usually what our heart and soul and mind has kind of been seeking. We just didn't maybe have a title for it. And I think both of us got in right at the groundswell. I know for me, it's been 20 years for you, maybe even a little longer. You were probably in the, some of those original groups with Jeff yeah. Bland and yeah, yeah. So, um, but when we find that this uh, systems biology that seeks to find root cause, it really resonates with why we went into medicine, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So let's introduce what you're talking about now, this new Highline technology. And I'm going to confess, I don't know a lot. I'm here to learn just like everybody else listening. Tell us, what is this? How did you get into it? And um, let's go from there. Brilliant. So, so first thing is, when I got into functional medicine, I was blown away. I wrote my second book. It was bestseller. And I was like, I was bombarded because we had four pages in the Washington Post and we had thousands and thousands of calls for months because it was basically a way of treating depression without yeah. medication or using less medication, avoiding mm -hmm. side effects. Couldn't treat all these people. So I screened people for people, uh, for I looked for people who would do a very, very thorough, very, very comprehensive functional medicine program, treatment resistant depression, mm -hmm. which as you may know from the STAR-D study, uh, only 25% of people with treatment-resistant depression with the conventional treatments of antidepressant and psychotherapy will respond at one year, only 25%. That's worse than placebo, wow. right? So I start treating everybody. Now, I was a psycho, I'm trained as a psychopharmacologist. So I was using meds like crazy up, up until the mid nineties. Then I took functional medicine. Then I wrote the book. I said, okay, these people are ready for it. So let me do it very thorough. I like to dive into all the systems. That's the way I do it. I dive in all at once. It's a lot of work, but it really works. And after a couple or three years, I'm like, I'm not even prescribing meds anymore. And I think everybody's getting better. And wow. then I, you know what, I think maybe I'm lying to myself. So I hired a statistician uh -huh. who took a all my cases of treatment resistant depression for that period of time, let's say two years, mm -hmm. it was 23 people. The mean Beck depression inventory score was 34, roughly 34 when we started. And um, by 10 months, they were all normal. Wow. 100%. Wow. Not that. Not only that, diabetes gone. Yeah. One woman with an MS, her MS lesion's gone, osteoporosis gone. You know, I'm like, you know, quality of life, energy, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, this is mind boggling, mind boggling. Okay, so fast forward. That's, so that's what I'm doing from, from like 2002 to 2017. You know, I retired actually in 2014 and then it didn't last very long. <laughs> Uh, so I went back into practice and then I, I, um, I had a, um, I took a retreat somewhere and I was just lying on a hammock for hours and reading and thinking, but I, was, I don't know how I got into it. I started thinking about lasers. Yeah. 
And um, so it's like 2017, 2018 or something. And I'm thinking like, well, how do you know like where to apply the laser? And then I thought about QEGs. About it. I just had an epiphany. I was like, oh, I think I need to learn QEGs. I need to learn about lasers, et cetera. And so I started to dive into that. So high lane is hyperbaric oxygen, mm -hmm. laser, okay. and neural exercises. Wow. Brain exercises. That's high lane. Okay. I developed this um, technique. It's patent pending, actually, um, to guide the laser to the site based on my QEG analysis. So I've been studying the QEG now for uh, four years or so. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it's a mind, I can't believe I practice without it. Wow. So what I learned, this is how I got into this. The first case that I did this with, actually, I'm going to, I'll share my screen here and okay. show you. I'm kind of excited about this. I just got an article accepted for publication today. It's in this article here. Wow, amazing. Okay, so reversal of acquired prosopagnosia using quantitative EEG guided laser therapy. Okay, so this just came out. I just and found for a lay audience, go ahead and define prosopagnosia. Yeah. Prosopagnosia is the inability. Agnosia is you can't recognize something. Prosop is the, the face, so you don't mm -hmm. recognize faces. So this was a, a woman who was in her 50s or so, and she had acquired it, meaning she wasn't born with this. Mm -hmm. She had something that happened, and she acquired it, and um, and there's no treatment for this. Right. Okay. So basically, she also had mild cognitive impairment. She had a family history of, of dementia that was very strong, and she also had temporal lobe seizures. She mm -hmm. had seizures. So <clears throat> basically, I'll skip through this, but I'll show you some images. Yeah. Uh, so this is her Q. I'll show you this on a, a different screen, actually, here. This will be a little better here. Perfect. Okay. So this is a QEG. Uh, um, this is one, one way of looking at a QEG. There's many, many aspects to it. Anything that's gray is normal. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that's yellow is or red is overactive or blue is underactive. So here we're looking at the eyes are in the front here where you see my cursor. If you, you can see my cursor yes. here. Mm -hmm. Here's right ear, left ear, right here. And so we see that the red cross hairs, hairs are pointing at the area of maximal instability, abnormality of the brain. Now here's, this is the hippocampus. This is the memory center, mm -hmm. right? For formulating memory, right? Her hippocampus was 2.2, 2.7 standard deviations from the norm, meaning it's way, way uh, malfunctioning in a very significant way. And it's overactive. This is the funny thing, right? The brain spends most of its energy keeping the foot on the pedal, inhibiting neuronal function. That's what takes the energy, okay? She doesn't have the energy, the processes to keep this stable for a variety of reasons. So here's her hippocampus before the treatment. And you can see there's abnormalities in different areas of the brain. And this is this yellow stuff here is information flow. So we can actually expand on this and, mm -hmm. and see that the information from Brodmann area, this particular area here is, is actually excessive information flow. That's like me yelling in your ear really loud. Yeah. You would not be saying something, but you still couldn't use it. Yeah, yeah. The blue is poor information flow. It's like me whispering and you know I'm maybe saying something, you still can't get information, right? And then, whoop, and then after the treatment here, wow, this is after um, hyperbaric oxygen, functional medicine. Uh -huh. Well, let me back up. This first image here is after functional medicine. Wow. And that's what blew me away. Yeah. Okay? So Person. the importance of that, Bob, is you're doing all the, the nutrition, the diet, the infections, the toxins, like all the stuff that I do in clinical practice, and you still have this massive abnormality. Yes, and that's what blew me away because clinically, she's doing better. 
-hmm. not perfect. She's still having some memory problems. She's still having some absence. She still has a prosopagnosia, can't recognize faces. So, you know, it's still some stuff, but she's working out in the gym again and she's doing better in a lot of ways. And then I do her QEG and this is my first QEG. And I'm like, whoa, I can't believe this. You know, I, I've been treating people now with functional medicine for 20 years and uh, mm -hmm. still brain problems. I, I couldn't believe it. So then what we did is we did laser treatments and uh, to specific areas on the left side of her brain, the areas that, that I mapped out based on this. And, and here she's, she's basically normal. Her hippocampus is now normal. Everything's normal here. There's a little inflammation, inflammation flow problem here, but it's very, very minor. Much so. less than before. Unbelievable. Yeah. So that's, that is, there's a few points here because remember we're putting, applying light. There's debate about um, LEDs, whether they penetrate the skull or not or whatever, you know, et cetera. But we do have evidence yeah. cadavers that, that the laser light is you know more coherent and that it penetrates, but I don't know that we know that it penetrates to the hippocampus. Yeah, we don't know that. So I think that basically by applying the light, that the energy the brain has its energy and then it can do the processes it needs to do and it translates down to deeper structures. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, Bob, a couple of questions come to mind that I'm just wondering. Number one, I'm guessing that like because you showed this woman who she, she had a really good functional model and care and it was improving. And yet you show us the images of the EEG and they're dramatically off. They're abnormal. Um, and I'm guessing that a lot of people can. Uh, I mean, I've even felt this in my own life with mold exposures. I can function on a really high level, even if I'm quite affected neurologically by the mold, right? Like no one would maybe notice. I can still make solve problems and I can still, so I'm guessing that you see that people can actually function pretty well when they have pretty significant impairments due to toxin or infection or inflammation. Is that true? hundred percent true. And we actually know in dementia mm -hmm. that the higher functioning you are, let's say you're a multilingual professor or something like that, that you could be developing Alzheimer's, for example, and if we looked in your brain, we'd be like, oh, my, this is terrible. But on the, in the world, yeah. you will be functioning fine. And you'll actually, when they discover you have Alzheimer's, your brain will actually look a lot worse than other people's when it's discovered because you've been able to function so yeah. much longer because of your capacity. So I think that's wow. definitely true. So the other point on this one is that we showed continued improvement one month without treatment. In other words, the brain continued to assimilate the treatment. Wow. Three months, however, there was deterioration because she has the APOE4, mm -hmm. you know, there are other processes. So she needs maintenance of this. It's not that much maintenance, but she needs maintenance. And uh, then we did objective testing of, of her, um, of her, well, this is the QEG objective this testing. This is objective testing of the Cambridge facial recognition mm -hmm. test. And she scored really well. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So published the, the case, you know. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the first case. The latest case, I'll tell you, is a, a woman who's about 72 with... Um, she has uh, dementia and she has, you know, all the stuff we see in dementia, you know, like the diabetes and, you know, toxins in the mold and the whole mm -hmm. thing. And I just felt like she has the most important thing for what I'm going to tell you. She has some aphasia. She couldn't really speak a full sentence. Mm -hmm. And then we did the, um, the QEG and et cetera, and, and I lasered her and, and her, she started speaking full sentences after the first treatment, not, not normal, okay, but, but full sentences, like two or three full sentences in a row. My husband and I we were both crying. Wow. And, and, you know, and, you know, that's not going to happen for everybody. Yeah. Obviously, the sooner you get to something, the better it is. We, we know that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But we have that. I have, this is a case here. This is a, this is a guy who had schizophrenia who had facial distort, uh, he would see people's faces as being hostile to him. Mm -hmm. And and so he was paranoid. And I found this tract here, you know, this, this is the vertical occipital fasciculus and the superior longitudinal fasciculus, I believe. 
and we tr lasered him here and right here and the cleared up and his facial recognition cleared. I mean, his distortion went away. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, his reading ability improved and this track here can, has a big effect on reading ability. I didn't, I didn't know that, but that's what happened. So we have that and here's a guy, this is a guy with um, basically this, this guy here, I think it was this guy. Anyway, I could go through cases. I'm not, I don't think you want to hear more cases and if you want, I, I can, but, but you see um, just, it's, it's a clear thing. So the main idea is to use the functional medicine and then layer onto it the high lane. Sometimes you use hyperbaric, sometimes the neurofeedback, sometimes it's laser, you know, different things. It's like you have more tools in your toolbox, but a couple of things that like, first of all, you're sitting on this retreat and it's kind of back to our first start there of like, we are scientists left brain and we were trained that way. But I feel like the real brilliant inspirations come from that right brain place when we're resting and we're open and you and I have a belief in a, in a greater power. And so often I find those miracles come from this place that we can't always explain. And when you told your story, that was my thought is like, you got a divine inspiration, Bob. I mean, yeah. I just love that. <laughs> I really did because it felt that way. I yeah. felt I was moved. I, um, I just felt like I was in a different place. Yeah. yeah. And it's always that place where we really surrender. We were talking about that before too. The world is the chaos and the pandemic keeps going. And, but the, the part of the lesson that we're all learning in this, and you're listening probably the same, same way is the surrender. And the more often that we surrender to something, it's, uh, it's unexpected. It's not the way we would have planned it. It's we let go of control, but the, the outcomes are often way more miraculous and unexpected and beautiful than if we were to plan and control for it and all that. So I love that story. Now I have lots of questions. Questions. Um, a couple things. I, uh, one thing before you, you, I just want to underline what you said. Yes. Well, I really believe, and I know you'll agree, healing occurs physically and spiritually. It's it's a bimodal thing. It's an interactive thing. If you you really need to, the you know we are connected to the metaphysical realm, whether people want to believe it or not. Yeah. There's facts that show this to be the case. Uh, we just have a narrow view. We're in interaction like a bilipid membrane, you know, there's interactions between this domain and the quantum domain and the metaphysical donor. There's interactions. And when you ask your higher power for help, you get help and you get protection. And so you need to be always looking at healing. Where's the healing? Where's the gratitude? Where's the good stuff? There's always good stuff coming. Even out of Corona, there's good stuff coming, you know, and you're going to get more good out of the bed, usually, um, uh, you just have to be in a in a that framework where you open your mind out of the physical and and heal on both levels. That's that's just. I love that synopsis because it's, again, that's what I believe too, and I've seen it in action. And I again, I love thinking about like left brain, right brain, analytical versus creative. And I was born kind of an analytical engineering scientist, and. God has really opened my eyes to the intuitive in this other realm. And I'll tell you what, sometimes I always, when I'm trying to explain it to patients or other people, it's almost like our left brain is an analytical computer that's analog and very, it can take hundreds of pieces of data and process it and come up with a solution. But when we open to the creative, intuitive, the more spiritual realm, we can literally subconsciously process in seconds or milliseconds, millions of pieces of data and come to a conclusion that's actually according to even good science is more right on more times than our analytical mind. So it's kind of like using both of those. And I always say I'm more now than ever open to that realm for answers. And then I prove it with science. Like I use both just like you do. You, you took a statistician and took your dad and said, what's the science behind what I'm doing? And you proved it. But some of the most beautiful things that we see happen in that realm of being open to intuition. Um, and I love that because I'm learning to trust it more and more <laughs> than I used to. So um, Bill Balti Taylor wrote my stroke of insight. I don't know if you've read that. It's a phenomenal short book where basically a lot of her left brain was wiped out. And so you had, she has a right brain experience mm -hmm. a mind, but you won't be able to put it down. Oh, I'm going to go get, get it right away. Stroke of insight. You said 
by stroke of insight. Oh, great. So as I'm listening, a couple of things. First of all, what I, I wanted to emphasize for those of you listening, the functional medicine is still kind of the basic. It's kind of like the foundation. So diet, nutrition, treat. So you're still doing kind of that approach, looking at infections and gut and toxins and all those things. Um, but again, what, what you found and what I found too, is there's a limit, there's like a wall you might hit where there's, you know, a certain place where you can't go beyond. And that's where you're finding these, um, extraordinary therapies of uh, hyperbaric and lasers. So let's talk real briefly, say one example there, what would be a typical treatment like, like how many sessions of hyperbaric would that take? Like maybe case one or case two, and then what would the laser sessions look like too? Like what kind of an amount of time or effort would this take? So, so the uh, hyperbaric, you know, the standard, if it's indicated, would be a minimum of 40 sessions. I use soft chambers. I think that the brain injury, that's pretty good. Uh, it's accessible to people. And, you know, they do an hour. I don't have people put on a, I, I have them use an oxygen concentrator. I don't have them wear a mask and breathe 100% oxygen. I am really uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Uh, because of uh, the count, the counter regulatory mechanisms and the lipid peroxidation, and I, I, I'm not comfortable. But having oxygen coming in, so you're getting more oxygen at pressure. Perfect. You do that daily if you can, or five days a week, 40 sessions. Then you recheck and see how things are going, and it depends on the condition. Some people use it as a health maintenance measure, um, and some people they're done at 40 sessions. You know, um, <clears throat> and then uh, laser. Uh, it kind of varies, you know, so, um, you know, I treat a guy, well, a woman with, with depression, really treatment resistant depression, uh, we, young, 30 years old, we did the functional medicine, worked on all the stuff. And then we did the laser when I feel like it's like the brain is like a plant, get the soil in order, make sure there's water, then give the light. Sometimes, sometimes you can't, you have to give the light right away, but in her case, it was 10 treatments, fine. I got a woman who's 80 years old with treatment-resistant depression, who wants to get off her effexor, and we're treating her, and she's coming off her effexor, and she's doing better than she's done in years and years. No depression this winter for the first time um, with the laser, you know? And then, uh, but then you have someone like the first case of prosopagnosia where she's going to need maintenance, you know? Uh, this is amazing. And uh, so, like I said, one thing I have a question on hyperbaric. Um, is there any contraindications or any patients that you would not give hyperbaric to? Well, yeah, you, with hyperbaric oxygen, there's obviously, first of all, if you've had a pneumothorax in the last year or, you know, maybe two years, you're not going to do it. Uh, there's controversy about seizures. Some people say, you know, it can promote seizures. Some people say, no, I haven't seen it promote seizures. We have a lot of people who have pre-seizure activity and it doesn't seem to be any problem. Uh, and then of course, uh, if you have a sinus infection, you can't clear your ears, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I think those are the high level uh, contraindications, I would say. Mm, that makes sense. One and then with the, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, and then the laser, again, you're and you talked about the controversy, but you're clearly getting results. I, it's interesting because I have heard the controversy, read it, and back five, six years ago when I really had the mold issue, I was using a device that goes on the head and does the red light, and it's very controversial because can it even go through the skull? It has one a prong that goes up the nose. You know which one I'm talking about. And for me, it was profound. I think it was a 40 hertz, so more the alpha. Um, and uh, for me, I, in fact, I still, if I have a day, I need just to be focused. That really, really works for me, but it's so funny because it's very generic, the placement, right? Like who knows where it's going? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, it's not even close to what you're doing with the precision, but to me, that was, uh, an aha personally to know there's something, this light really does work. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I, I've been in debate, uh, about this, um, with some people and looking at the literature and. It's almost like, here's where I, I'm at. So <clears throat> does it penetrate? I don't have any evidence. Um, could there be remote effects? Mm -hmm. Remote effects. Uh, my, here's my concern is, is that the people who are promoting it, so I'm not doubting that it worked for you, yeah. by the way. I think it worked for you. Um, but the history in psychiatry over 250 years is that there's always like a paradigm and everybody's excited and yes, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes. You know, the research says, yeah, wasn't it great? And then people go out, like they used to take psychiatric patients and put them in like these centrifuges to spin them. 
and, and and they were like, wow, this is really working. The psychosis, the neurosis is going uh-huh. away. Why don't I build one for 10 people? So yeah. all the mental health institutions had these carousels, centrifuges for 10 people. Unbelievable. <laughs> and the research was, and people making money, and then the yeah. research was not so good. And then yeah. that's 50 years right there. It takes 50 years, 60 years cycle. And then, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, mm-hmm. oh but there's insulin coma. Insulin coma really. Then there's, you know. Yeah. yeah. We're, so there's always the fad and the people who are marketing these things yeah. Doing the studies and making my concern is I want to see studies you know, from objective, non interested parties. Yeah. Not from the company who makes the device. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think the light is really, I, I, I don't have any questions about the light being effective. And I'm going to say your device is effective, for, but it's not as targeted yeah. as my device. So mine is more, much more specific for specific conditions, et cetera. And and I hope it's true that it works. And, you know, I mean. Well, I almost am saying that because I, I so agree with you. What you're doing is such on a different level than anything. Um, and interestingly for me, the pulsed electromagnetic frequency, the PEMF, which does have decent data, um, I found just as good a benefit with that. So it's something energetically. Again, it might, like you said, it could be a very not specific. Um, it could just be the light energy of some, you know, frequency that is is not at all specific. And I, I believe that. And, and the more it's been since that time of this device coming out, the more I doubt, is that really the way to go? So what I love is that you're doing this very targeted, specific, and hopefully, are there other people interested in what you're doing and learning it? Like, can we multiply what you're doing and teach this and share it? And I'm open to teaching it to clinicians, you know, I mean, it, it took me, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of time to learn, figure this thing out, but, and I'm still learning, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to teach it. I've, uh, I had to put the whole treatment on hold initially, the laser treatment, mm-hmm. not the uh, not the hyperbarics and not the neurofeedback. We actually have kind of figured out how to do neurofeedback in people's homes. So mm-hmm. wow. that was an advantage of COVID. Now we can do it anywhere in the country. Oh, and that's amazing. That's even better. So you can do it remote. Um, what are options if people like, what's the best uh, getting your book, going to the website? How can people get more information about what you're doing and not overwhelm you? <laughs> I think, um, well, I haven't published except for this article. Uh-huh. I just found out today, if I want it to be open access, it's $3,200. Huh. <laughs> Maybe someone can donate to the cause, Bob. I'm going to put that out there because I love your work. <laughs> nobody's going to read this this is terrible there are people because of agnosia and now nobody's going to know about it um so that was news to me so um how to i guess if you're needing treatment or you you if you have some serious interest i mean contact me through the website is the best way i have i've started writing a book i, I want to write about this and get it out there you know it's got to get out there and uh and uh, I'm open to treating uh, physicians who, because this is a class four medical device and you know, you really need to know what you're doing. Um, and I, this is, you know, I, I'm like, say goodbye to psychiatry. I mean, yeah. not psychology, but meds and therapy. I'm not anti-therapy. I think there's specific places for therapy and, and even meds, I'm not anti-meds. There's specific places for meds for sure, yeah. but the data, the science is so beyond where people are practicing yeah. that, you know, this is 50 years ahead, 70 years ahead, you know. Yeah, there's and, something called standard of care that we all know about in medicine. If you're listening, you don't know medicine. It's like, what's the standard of the average doctor or what they do in their office? And so we are all kind of set you know, up against that standard of care. The problem is that's 30 years old, maybe 50 years old. It's not at the bleeding cutting edge of what's advancements and good science are, are showing us as possible. Bob and I are kind of pushing that edge. We're always trying things. My, my um, theory is always, as long as there's very little risk and I understand what I'm doing and I give full informed consent, I'm willing to push that with patients um, you know, of course with their permission with stuff that has decent early preliminary data that it's safe and effective. Um, and so you and I are thinking on that. Um, and I believe this kind of stuff with light and with hyperbaric and with some of the new things that we have and in, more in an energetic realm too, this is where medicine is headed because it's so much more powerful than the old pharmaceuticals, like one receptor type of medicine. And we, if, speaking of safety with the, with the laser, uh, we're very careful about, you know, obviously you don't want to heat anything. So mm-hmm. we do 
we always do an MRI, make sure there's no, no uh, lesions in the brain, et cetera, before we do anything like this. We want to know what we're doing, where we're doing it, is it, mm -hmm. is it not? Um, so that safety is obviously number one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so that's kind of what we're doing. And uh, real quick question again, this is me just you know wondering. Um, I've done some neuroquant. I haven't found them super helpful. And for anyone who knows what they are or doesn't know what they are, this is just volumetrics of the brain portion. So say the hippocampus, it'll tell us the volume, uh, an average volume in compared to average populations. And again, what you can see is expansion or uh, atrophy or shrinkage of different regions and maybe make assumptions. Again, I don't know how much we have clinical application of that. I've not, you know, but I'm curious as to, do you think the EEG findings will sometimes correlate with that or is it totally not? Oh, they correlate. The EEG correlates with MRI, correlates symptomatically, correlates with the DTI is in the literature and the neuroquant, it correlates. The neuroquant I use, you know, I use it here and there. I like it. I just ordered one today on someone with, uh, I don't think she has Parkinson's, but she looks like she has Parkinson's. I think it's a traumatic head injury, uh, but I, I did, for example, about two and a half years ago, I did a neuroquant on a woman who had motor problems and some cognitive problems, and she had shrinkage of various areas, the putamen, et cetera, really subnormal. And then we repeated it two years later, she's normal. Wow. Wow. Normal. Well, that's powerful. It is. You know? And mm -hmm. she couldn't believe it. She says, I, I don't believe it. I said, well, you have to believe it. Yeah. Look at we have this data. Well, that's again how we can kind of uh, find out what does that really mean? I don't have any symptoms and your brain has, the brain grows back. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, if that's the one message we leave people with the neuroplasticity, which is, you know, this better than anyone. Do you want to describe to the general person listening? What is neuroplasticity and what does that mean for you if you're ill or for us as physicians? Yeah. We are, we are neuroplastic, right? We learn, we change, right? And that is always reflected in changes in how the brain nuclei, the groups of cells or nerve tracts, the highways of the brain, the information highways of the brain. If you have PTSD, certain ones get bigger and the others get smaller and the traffic, the information flow is rooted down the wrong highway. You know, it's the brain is morphing slowly over time, all the time. So it has that ability. Now, if you give it, you get out, like Baker said, Sydney Baker, take the bad stuff out, put in the good stuff, and then it, it actually heals. If you have one thing to talk about is like chronic Lyme, right? Mm -hmm. Like chronic Lyme, much more ubiquitous than people think, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Something like that, you know, is going to impair your plasticity, right? So you have to make sure to test. And the way, the way we've been testing, this is kind of interesting, is mm -hmm. doing challenge tests now. So what we do is we, you know, we put people on antibiotics for, or, or herbals, yeah. but generally antibiotics for three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then we do a very, very thorough panel with uh, IgeNex. Yeah. And then, you know, we're more likely to see a positive and we don't see a positive, then we, you know, that, okay, you don't have it. But to overlook that could be a big problem. Mm -hmm. But the plasticity is like amazing. It's a lot of work. And, you know, it's a lot of work. It is, and you describe it, all your protocols and everything so easily, but what Dr. Bob does here is phenomenal and at a level that's probably in the top 0.1% of our colleagues in, in the whole United States. So it is just a pleasure to hear about this. I can't wait to hear, to read your book and to hear more as it comes out. Um, people can find you at wholepsychiatry.com. Is that correct? Yes, and if anyone knows a good author who can help me write it, let me know. Oh, I'll be in touch after. <laughs> so thanks again for your info today, Bob. It's just a pleasure as always to talk to you. Great. Thank you so much for all your great teaching and your great work and educating the public. You're just doing such a great, great service. And I see you on your retreats that you're going on. I'm like, oh, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll keep talking. We'll have you on again and talk some more. Thanks again, Bob. Thank you.